Welcome to Go Engineer HQ. Today, we're going to be showing you guys how we made these awards. Uh, these awards are one of the most important awards that we give to our coworkers uh, each year. They signal who were the top achievers. Uh, President's Club, it's always tied to a trip and they always have a theme along with the destinations. So this year's destination was Mexico and we tied that into the design theme. I'm going to walk you guys through the design just a little bit on the conceptual level. And then we're going to talk about the making of these awards. We have 3D printed parts. We have actually concrete or cement parts. And there's a whole process that went into the design and making of these that I think many people will be interested in. So as you're watching this, be thinking about how you might design a similar project and also think about what it means to think of a 3D printer as a shape creator or as a tool to be used creatively. So let's talk a little bit about the design of these awards. The destination for this year's trip was Cancun. Uh, it's nestled in the Yucatan Peninsula. And that area has a deep history in Mayan culture, Mayan civilization. And so I was going to draw on that history for the design. And I nestled on the Chichen Itza. So I knew I was going to have to do something with that pyramid shape. And I wanted to bring you know, a little bit of Go Engineer into the design as well. Go Engineer is it's a cutting edge technology company. We sell 3D CAD software, we sell 3D printers, we sell 3D scanners. This is really high tech stuff. So how do we bring the new world into the old world in a design that someone's going to look at and think, ah, I really like that. So this is what we ended up on. It's about 50% Chichen Itza that's been squoes and lifted and it's not quite a perfect pyramid. And then the second half is very colorful and it uses a palette that is kind of associated with technology, the blues, the purples, but also pays homage to a color palette that I've seen used in more contemporary Mexican art. So that's a little bit of background about the inspiration of the design. While I don't think it's going to win any awards itself, I'm pretty proud of it. So let's dive into each half separately and talk about how we made each one. This is essentially two halves that are bonded together with a simple epoxy. And the first half that we're going to talk about is a straight 3D print. These parts come off the printer, essentially how you see it right here. They are coated in a support material that we either soak off in water or blast off with a little pressurized water, but more or less they come out of the machine looking like this. The second half of this print is the more fun half. So this is where we had to get a little bit creative and really commit to the design inspiration. As I mentioned, Chichen Itza was the inspiration of the, the old half of the design. And Chichen Itza carries some symbolism, but it also is made of stone and it has weight to it. And that was an important element to me as the designer that I wanted to carry into the design. Now, I know this is more of an artistic project and probably if you're watching this, you don't do a lot of this type of design but this concept is 100% applicable to mechanical designs and conceptual designs and other types of designs that you might be printing. You're always asking what's important, what's a showstopper if I were to lose that, and trying to find ways and searching for tools to get you where you need to be. Now that's where the 3D printer really makes a difference. It's a very versatile tool. And when you have multiple printers in your office, the versatility is almost limitless. The first thing I had to do was come up with a plan of action for how we're going to do it. And that started with how do we make a mold? So when we are mold making, there are a few steps to the process. The first step is we have to create a pattern. And the pattern is what we want to replicate in whatever molded material we're going to do. The molded parts will never be better in quality than the pattern. So quality is of utmost importance when we're creating a pattern. And for that reason, I chose to print our pattern of Chichen Itza on the Origin P3 printer. It's a DLP printer, and the surface finish right out of the printer is honestly unlike any 3D printed part I've ever seen in 10 plus years. It's absolutely amazing, it's watertight, and is a perfect fit for pattern making. Uh, I've made molds in the past, 
And in this case, because of the shape of the mold and because I didn't really concern myself with avoiding undercuts and other areas that would be problematic when we're trying to pull out of the mold, I decided on a silicone mold. And then when we're creating the mold, we have to suspend it in air. So I created some features that allow me to thread some uh, rod along the part like this, and then I need to hold this in space. So within SolidWorks, I created what I called a mold housing. And what this is intended to do is create a cavity that's about three quarters of an inch consistently all around the shape of the pattern. Uh, that's important because the rubber material that we're using, it's going to cure better if it's no thicker than about three quarters of an inch and if it's consistent wall thickness. So being able to 3D print a pattern holder that is the shape that I want was actually a, a big benefit. In this case, I used an FDM printer. It was the F370 and I printed it in ASA material in a sparse fill. But you can see it's got the step in here and it mimics the shape of the pattern. It also has some features that allow me to take these threaded rods and run them through the part and suspend this in air. Now, when I first used this casing, the bottom was closed because these print with a raft on the bottom and I just kept the raft on the bottom, but I did want to create a hole in the, in the design so that once the mold is ready and a concrete part is in it, I can pop it out. So we're gonna quickly cap this so that when we pour our rubber, it doesn't go all over our nice table. So what we see here is a cavity, all right? We have a 3D printed pattern and we have a 3D printed housing for this. And what we're going to do is mix the rubber, pour it in here, and then that's gonna cure overnight. So I have some other parts here that we're gonna show the whole process here, but count on about a day's worth of time for that to cure. And so one thing I'm going to want to do is coat this with some sort of release agent so that the rubber doesn't interlock with the, with the print. So I just like to use Vaseline. Make sure you get your gloves and uh, make sure you protect the table with your gloves and then just come in here with your fingers and get the Vaseline in there. All right, so now that that's greased up, we're going to put our pattern in there. Okay, and now that's ready. So let's pour and mix our rubber. Uh, we have two mixing containers. We have what used to be a kitchen spatula. And then we have our Umu 25 rubber. I've used Umu 25, I've used Umu 30 for this project and either one's gonna work. These are one-to-one -one, uh, mixes by volume. So that makes it easy. You don't really have to follow the instructions in order to make this. And just by chance, this happens to be sized in a way that it takes pretty much exactly two pints, which is what this container comes out of. So we lucked out there. So we're gonna hand mix this. Although I would recommend just getting a cheap mixer on a drill if you're gonna be doing a few of these. Makes it a little bit easier. So once we feel like this is adequately mixed, we're going to make sure this is centered and we're just gonna pour this in the mold. So we're just gonna take this up to the top surface and I would eventually wanna rest this on a fairly level surface because it does self-level to a certain degree. And then we'll just let it sit. So now that the rubber portion of this mold has been made, 
and off camera, totally no problems at all with that curing completely. Uh, we would end up the next day with a mold that's like this. So our pattern would be initially inside this mold. So first I'm gonna show you a little bit about this rubber pattern here. So on the bottom, we have our hole, we pop that out. And when we initially make this, we would have our pattern stuck in here. And I'm gonna cut a seam on this side because when we look at our model, that's the side that's going to be covered with the, the glue joint. So you just take a sharp knife and cut a jagged line into your rubber. If you need more than one seam, uh, you'll know. But this can be pulled out uh, significantly. And if we see the inside of this mold, it replicated the surface finish of the 3D printed part completely. So every detail that's in that 3D printed part is gonna transfer over to the mold and then that's gonna transfer over to our molded parts. So we have the soft mold. The next step is to fill that with some cement. So I'm gonna mix some of this up. Don't be intimidated, it's really easy. It's a four to one mixture of cement mix to water. So let's take care of that. We're gonna get up on my tippy toes and we're gonna do about four of these. These are one third cup. The amount really doesn't matter. It's just the ratio. And I've found that since this is not a structural part, I mean, if I mix it a little bit wet, uh, that helps with the surface quality of the printed part or the molded part. All right, I'm gonna pour some water, one, and then maybe like a half. It really, you really can use too much water. So we'll kind of move this out of the way. And I'm not gonna mix this by hand. I'm gonna mix it by power tools. All right, this rapid set uh, does set fairly rapidly. So you wanna get it mixed in, in the mold. Uh, fairly quickly. You have a few minutes of working time. Uh, before I pour this in, notice that this has deteriorated just a bit. We are going to get a flashing, which you're going to see on the molded part here, uh, but I want to take note of that. Um, this one, we don't want to introduce air if we can help it. So we're just going to try to pour it into the very bottom. And that's it. So. I'm gonna clean up the rest of the cement before it totally cures and let this sit for about eight hours until it's ready to be pulled. So we've cast the cement into the mold and we've waited a few hours and we're ready to demold the part. Uh, let's take a look at what that looks like. So I have this version uh, that I created yesterday and we're gonna demold this part. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process of cleaning up the part, and then we're gonna bond these two together and we'll have a finished award. So again, I can't stress enough, find an easy way to release this. If I didn't have this part, I would just be trying to catch a bottle this and it really wouldn't work very well and it would risk damaging the part if it ejected out. So having that hole in the bottom is pretty key. Now this is where we're going to pull the seam and we're kind of just gonna peel it. And you may need to peel any intricate edges. So we're just gonna kind of muscle it out. I mean, we do have significant flashing here, and that's because of the degradation of the mold over time. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna trim it off and sand it flat and we'll be good to go. But if the flashing was on any edge that's critical, so surface, uh, critical surface or critical dimension, then you're gonna have to do some more extensive post-processing to get the part that you want. Now to deal with this flashing, because it's so thin and because the cement really doesn't have any structural integrity, I can kind of just chip away at it. As it deteriorates more and that flashing becomes thicker, then you may need to introduce some hand tools so some clippers or maybe a screwdriver 
to kind of just clean up that edge. In order to get a good seal here, I'm gonna to wanna to chip this out. So at that point, the only thing that's left to do is to bond these together. I'm using Gorilla Epoxy, which is another way of saying the type of epoxy really doesn't matter. This is a simple two-part epoxy. We don't need a lot. Give it a quick mix. We're gonna dab a little bit of this onto the concrete. So you do have a registration feature and that's gonna help align these. That's an important design element. And like I said, there's about 30 thou of play between these. You're gonna set it on and then you wanna give it a little bit of pressure. So the way I've been doing it is I just let it rest like that and let it cure for um, maybe 10 minutes, and then it'll be good to go. The only thing that's left once it's cured is because that top surface of the mold was not a precision surface, I would take these to a belt sander or some sort of sander and just sand them flat. That way you don't get a lot of wobble if it's not on concrete. You don't get a lot of wobble. There we go, that one's nice and sturdy. So it's little details like that. I wanna thank you guys for joining me in this uh, session here. It's been actually a lot of fun to describe the conceptual design of this, some of the inspiration of it, and share with you just the idea that these 3D printers are, first and foremost, they're shape creators. And what we do with those shapes are totally up to us. It's up to our own creativity and our own willingness to experiment. And whether you're doing art projects or you're doing jigs and fixtures for you know, rocket companies, the same elements apply. You can design intuitively, you can design for purpose first, and you can speed up the whole process and do it in a way that's more accurate, more precise, and more repeatable than you could ever do by hand. And you have a lot of fun doing it too. So thanks for joining. And if you have some ideas on how I could do this better, next time, uh, let us know in the comments.